Hello everyone, welcome to Field Notes, an exploration of functional medicine. I'm Rob Downey, a family practice MD and Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. I'm coming to you from Seaworthy Functional Medicine in Homer, Alaska. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Today we are fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. Tim Jackson. Good morning, Dr. Tim. Hey, Dr. Rob, how are you? Just terrific, thanks. I'm excited that you gave us your time today, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. So, like a lot of thought leaders in functional medicine, you have an extensive bio and anything important I leave out, please add it. You're a doctorate in physical therapy, you've got a, a science, a health science degree as well. You've got many years of expertise helping people in functional medicine, like a lot of functional medicine thought leaders. You have a book, you have a website, you have a program, you've been part of summits. And the, the folks that you tend to help, you, you help everyone that wants to be their best. This can include business people, athletes. And then like also like a lot of thought leaders, you've had your own personal journey, which yeah. sort of drove home the importance of functional medicine for you as you presumably became very motivated to want to share it with others. Is that accurate then most definitely you know when i uh i originally was going to get my md and my senior year at wake forest uh university uh during the christmas break i had a eight and a half hour jaw surgery so i was under anesthesia for eight and a half hours and i ended up with 26 titanium screws and six titanium plates in my maxilla and mandible and needless to say that, uh, you know, didn't bode well for being healthy. And so a lot, I had been exercising and eating well, but things that my body was able to keep at bay prior to the surgery, now they were expressing and become uh, manifesting at the clinical level, basically. Mm -hmm. So I know from preparing for today, there was a long journey for you through candida and all kinds of different learning iterations. And like many of us who had to sort of scrabble through on our own over years through these different issues, now that you're able to offer people expertise, you can accelerate their, their progress, keep them out of the weeds yeah. and, and moving quickly into the high yield stuff. There's so many interesting ideas you gave us to, to drill down into today, I wanted to jump into testing because you're an expert in testing. And I think functional medicine participants face a dilemma. There's this old school kind of uh, proprietary sense that people get from their medical provider to only do labs ordered by the medical provider. Leaves a lot of folks unsatisfied because they know a free cortisol could be helpful or a free T3 or knowing the right. good versus bad estrogens. And then the flip side is if they're not ordered by a provider, the person can feel like they're freewheeling or they're a little bit at loose ends. So would you illuminate the importance of labs for us and, and give people a sense of how to, how to chart their course? Yeah, so I think the most important thing to remember is that most uh, traditional allopathic doctors, you know, believe that if it's not through a hospital lab or lab or quest, then it's not legitimate. And, you know, that's simply not the case. Uh, there are plenty of legitimate uh, labs out there um, that are accurate. But the most important thing to remember, no matter what lab you're using, is that the reference range was calculated based on a population of people who probably aren't all that healthy. And so just to give a quick example, if we look at testosterone 40 years ago and what the level, the average level was, and you know, the range is very broad from 250 to 800. And so if you're at 800, assuming your free testosterone is pretty good, then you're gonna feel good overall. But if you're at 250, you might be depressed, you might be uh, receiving treatment for depression, uh, you might have a uh, fatigue or chronic fatigue. And so uh, I give that example to people along with thyroid levels you know, thyroid and cholesterol levels are go in the opposite direction. And so uh, as thyroid uh, free T3 levels have gone down over the years, cholesterol levels have gone up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I would add that the thyroid normal ranges uh, have a real tendency in the conventional normal ranges to include people with suboptimal thyroid function. So I think another example of how the data can be skewed and sort of distort people's cognitive lens for what's optimal versus sort of grossly acceptable, which unfortunately is often suboptimal and thus left Definitely. unaddressed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think every cell in the body has a receptor for thyroid hormone. And so when the thyroid gland is suboptimal, or you can have uh, cellular hypothyroidism where it's not getting into the cell because the blood is too viscous, or you could have a liver phase one, phase two detox issue where T4 is not getting converted to T3. And so I think, you know, you have to take all of those into account. Mm -hmm. So when somebody works with you, then what's, what's their, how, where's their net as it were, meaning uh, as they interpret these labs, uh, as you and I are following this number one principle of do no harm, how do they navigate with the labs they get? Um, you know, how does that work for people? I'm sure our audience is going to be really curious, right? Like, how do I explore this? How would I do that? <laughs> yeah, so I would say, I mean, there are many thyroid markers that are important, but free T3, you know, your active thyroid hormone metabolite is mm -hmm. probably the most important. And I like to see that, you know, reference ranges can vary somewhat, but in general, 3.5 or higher. Mm -hmm. And that's assuming that reverse T3 is also uh, not above, say, 15 to 18, mm -hmm. uh, because that, you know, even if free T3 levels are optimal, if reverse T3 is high, it can sort of block the receptors in sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, people can certainly go by that. And then, you know, the thing to keep in mind is if you have low T4 and low T3, then reverse T3 probably will be low, but as you optimize it, um, you know, it's go there's gonna be more converting into reverse T3. And then on the other end, you have the thyroid antibody, which isn't really a thyroid problem, it's an immune system issue. Um, you know, the immune system forgets the ability to recognize self versus non-self. And so uh, you have to address whatever's causing that. And as you know, there are many things such as Epstein-Barr virus, certain harmful bacteria in the gut, mold toxicity that uh, cause the body, the immune cells to attack the thyroid gland. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, keep it, you wanna, in an ideal world, the thyroid antibodies to be as close to zero as possible. Mm. And at, at like, uh, so with your program or other programs, would people then talk to you about what lab to use? And then would they talk to you in some sort of setting about how to interpret them? Is that the new yeah. domain that's emerging? Uh, yeah, so I mean, any client who works with me, you know, some come with a lot of lab work and so we can get started right away. Other times we'll have the initial consult, we'll decide on a course of action and what tests uh, to order first, uh, because you know uh, many of the functional medicine tests are out of pocket in many cases. And so uh, you know we definitely go over um, uh, each lab results uh, during our sessions, and uh, you know then they get my type of recommendations, but I tr want them to understand really why we're doing what we're doing. Um, because I think that makes people more compliant and it helps with the education process. And they can pass that information on to friend or family member, which, you know, making the world a better place is all part of my uh, agenda and core values and mission as well. Uh, so if, you, you know, you, you don't have a provider or you're just doing some direct to consumer lab testing, you know, you can certainly find uh, reference ranges online. For example, thyroid, what's optimal versus what's considered normal. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell people normal is Homer Simpson. You don't want to be <laughs> Homer Simpson. <laughs> that sort of drives the point home, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you have some things you can share with us about simple things people can do to be healthier. Let's, let's segue to that, I'm sure. Our listeners yeah. who I thank for joining us will want to will want to know about that. 
So one thing is uh, spending more time in nature. There's a good book called Nature Deficit Disorder versus Attention Deficit Disorder. And so when you're and my friend Jack Cruz, who's a neurosurgeon, you know, he tells his patients and he's being very serious to get up, get completely naked and roll around in the grass. And the idea behind that is you're getting electrons from the earth you know, added to your body, which decreases inflammation. And then you're also getting morning sunlight, which I know is a uh, scarcity in your neck of the woods. And so uh, the, I don't know, do you use uh, sun lamps with your patients? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, cheap and low cost things, you know, if you can't go outside because it's too cold and snowing, then at the very least, you know, you use a sun lamp um, bundle up. And even if you're not getting direct sun exposure, being outside, just a calm walk, it's not taxing on the nervous system. And, you know, we're bombarded by, you know, cell phone, email, Facebook, all these other devices. And I think people forget that what goes into your nervous system is just as important as what goes in your mouth. Mm. And so That's that powerful. direct sunlight, yeah, is, you know, can't really be replaced um, and spending time outside. And then, you know, along those same lines, but sort of a number two would be optimizing your circadian rhythm. So your 24 hour cycle and, you know, our entire body, uh, different organ systems do different activities based on that 24 hour clock. So the liver, gallbladder, they're detoxing heavily in kidneys, you know, from 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. And so uh, if you can uh, focus on, you know, going to bed uh, around 9 or 9.30 um, and then getting up as the sun comes up. But I know that, you know, that changes for your population again. <laughs> And it's challenge. That's good. You keep me on my toes because I'm having to rethink things. Um, but yeah, I think as long as you can optimize um, your circadian rhythm and your sleep cycle, and just the question I tell people to always ask themselves is, you know, if we didn't have electricity, what would we be doing right now? And, you know, most of the time it's, oh, we would be asleep, right? So that's what nature intended. And uh, it, it's more than just optimizing your sleep cycle. It actually controls a uh, level of a molecule that you know all about called NAD, which is an energy generating molecule, but also anti-aging. And uh, it affects, your circadian rhythm affects over 300 different gene expressions. Mm. It's, yeah. It's big, yeah. Yeah, and so and those two those two things I would say, um, along with balancing your blood sugar, and so you know that can be a whole talk, but basically you know eating uh, every you know it's going to vary depending on your metabolic flexibility, if you will, but you know making sure you get protein at each meal to keep your blood sugar from going up and then down. Um, because you know that's way more taxing on your body than just steady high blood sugar. And so, um, you know, when you talk about balancing hormones, you know, the first one that we need to balance along with cortisol is uh, glucose and uh, insulin. And mm -hmm. so I think that's extremely important, uh, avoiding uh, simple sugars. And, you know, when you do uh, have dessert or something of that nature, making sure you have enough fiber and protein with your meal. Mm, very and good. So, you know, all those things are, are free and, um, you know, they can make a huge difference in your quality of life, your health related quality of life. And since we're talking about light, again, in the preparatory materials, you shared with us that if you had to pick one thing to emphasize the most, it would be not only the circadian rhythm and getting the sunlight, the adding the good dimension of functional medicine, uh, but to be careful about blue light. Would you elaborate that for us a little bit? Also? Yeah, so as I sit underneath some artificial blue light, 
or uh, what we call non-native blue light because the sun has obviously beneficial blue light. But uh, for example, at night, you know, if I have my devices on and I don't have my blue blocker glasses, so that signal is hitting the retina and going to the part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which tells it tells our body that we're awake and it's daylight and to stop producing melatonin. So you're interfering with your sleep and you're confusing your body. And that's why so many people will sleep a certain number of hours. But they never get into those deeper stages of sleep. And mm -hmm. so um, the artificial blue light, you know, it can be balanced out um, by getting enough natural sunlight and or I haven't done this very much because I tend to stain myself and spill it, but methylene blue. Now, if anyone Googles that, it's going to scare them because it's used to clean aquariums, but that's in a really high dose. We're talking very small doses. You know, some you can get it via several supplement companies, but also some compounding pharmacies and you can apply topically. And what that does is it helps basically preserve your mitochondria. And so this is kind of the 30,000 foot view, but you know, I've always been a little bit obsessed with biochemistry and what Dr. Jack Cruz uh, encouraged me to do early on in my career was to understand that the biophysics of our environment drive the biochemistry. And what I mean by the biophysics are, you know, the natural sunlight versus artificial lights, EMFs uh, from the earth versus non-native EMFs from 5G, uh, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's a great segue into the mitochondria, the power plants of the cells, and I know you're an expert on that too. So as we make that transition, illuminate for us, if you would, how light affects the mitochondria, because I think this will be, some folks will be familiar with it, but it'll be really new to others, perhaps. Yeah, so I read a stat, and I haven't been able to uh, validate this, but it said that two-thirds of mitochondrial energy production comes from photons from the sun. So photons are energy generating molecules and specifically the mitochondria, they help with that proton gradient, which is what drives the production of energy in the first place. And so um, the natural blue light, it's uh, helping boost your mitochondria versus the artificial blue light, which is having a harmful or deleterious effect on your mitochondria. And different tissues in the body are gonna have different concentrations of mitochondria. So the brain and central nervous system uh, at the top of the list, the heart, I know of a cardiologist in Ohio who uses a VO2 max test as a measure of mitochondrial improvement. And so, you know, those two systems, uh, particularly the brain, you know, if someone has brain fog, or I talked to a gentleman yesterday who has glaucoma and another eye issue. You know, the eyes are just extension of the brain. And the brain has 9% of the body's mitochondria, but it's consuming around 20 to 22% of the body's oxygen and energy. And so you have a few mitochondria doing a lot of work. And so when there's, uh, they're suboptimal or they don't work optimally, then you're going to notice it first in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes so much sense. And I've noticed over the years in functional medicine, just the mitochondrial support is so high yield. So many of my patients were emphasizing B vitamins and magnesium right out of the gate, food sources and or supplementation. And I love these dimensions you're adding to, uh, again, support the mitochondria and also uh, very straightforward measures to not insult them. <laughs> They've got, right. they're really supporting us. So it's a shame. Yeah, an interesting, <laughs> undercut so, them. an interesting stat I came across uh, about a year ago was that roughly 35% of all medications are mitotoxic. Uh, so, you know, we know about fluoroquinolones and their potential for tendon ruptures, but depending on your epigenetics, if you have a uh, polymorphism and superoxide dismutase, which is an uh, antioxidant, you know, that protects your mitochondria, then uh, you're going to have uh, systemic 
uh, mm -hmm. side effects from the fluoroquinolones. Sometimes they're reversible completely. Sometimes they're partially reversible. But you know, I think unless it's a life-threatening situation, uh, try to avoid because usually there's alternatives, correct? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. To using fluoroquinolone, mm -hmm. there's no need to use a grenade when you know you could just tap someone on the back. Right. Thankfully, this whole issue of what's called antimicrobial stewardship has emerged strongly where uh, doctorate level pharmacists are often involved in the prescribing teams at creating these feedback loops to use the narrowest spectrum safest antibiotic. And then I think functional medicine providers like yourself and me are always reminding folks when and why an antibiotic is necessary for a life-threatening illness. And right. uh, these cautions, if, you know, if you have a if you have a cold and some congestion, don't be jumping right on and right. <laughs> give your body the support it needs, and and don't insult your your beneficial bacteria in your gut. I was really struck when I heard David Perlmutter a few years ago, the author of Grain Brain and the Functional Medicine Neurology Luminary out of Florida, point out that uh, evolutionarily there's a pretty good chance the mitochondria were these kind of uh, precursor bacteria-esque um, uh, critters right. that we incorporated into our cells symbiotically. And so it's no surprise that antibiotics would tend to insult them categorically. Yeah, definitely. And uh, even medications like benzodiazepines, um, certain antihypertensive medications. Uh, and so I'm not saying stop your medication. That's not what I'm saying. Um, so it's important for people to realize that, but, you know, talk to your prescriber, your doctor about, you know, your concern for uh, switching to a different medication that could potentially have the same clinical benefits and then supporting uh, the mitochondria with the nutrients and the antioxidants to protect it. Mm, very good. Very good. Uh, let's talk lymphatics. That's super important yeah. too, right? Yeah, so the lymphatic system, you know, especially in today's world, uh, it's really overloaded and sort of congested because of all the toxins and pathogens that we're exposed to. So, you know, the lymphatic system is like the garbage disposal system of the body. And unlike the cardiovascular system, where the heart helps to pump blood throughout the body and returns uh, to the superior um, vena cava, then, um, you know, with the lymphatic system, you have to have muscular contractions mm -hmm. or some sort of movement to get those going. So uh, movement isn't just for burning calories. Um, you know, it activates different areas of our brain, the cerebellum, um, different uh, parts of um, the cardiovascular system, et cetera. So uh, with the lymphatic system, you know, there are several different ways to get it going. Um, one that's very inexpensive, and there are many uh, high quality YouTube videos on how to do this, but dry skin brushing. Mm. And so you typically start, you know, distally far away from your body and move proximally, you know, on both sides of the arm. And then you would do the other arm. And then you would start at the ankle and come up with both legs. And that helps to sort of mobilize some lymphatic fluid. And uh, that can help with detoxification and immune function because when your body uh, deals with the pathogen and it dumps the immune cells and the pathogen into the lymphatic system, it's just sort of sitting there and uh, that toxic load is still stressful on your body. Mm -hmm. uh, another way that's uh, inexpensive, you can get them now for, I think, 200 bucks, um, a vibration plate to stand on. And that has many other benefits, especially for women dealing with low bone mineral density. It can help improve that. Um, you know, if you have a balance issue, obviously there's bars to hold on to, but starting low, like even four to five minutes, you know, every other day, if you're very toxic and then building your way up. And so that vibration, um, my ex-girlfriend, she had one and I got on it and I got connected into a TV program and I ended up staying on there for like 40 minutes, which is a no-no. And I was like, this doesn't do anything. 
And about two hours later, all I could taste was metal. Oh and so, <laughs> yeah, it definitely has uh, benefits. And a little misadventure there. A, there. <laughs> exactly. There's uh, also a study that came out, I think, last year that showed, and I don't know the mechanism, but that vibration plates uh, improve the diversity of the microbiome in the gut. Uh, and I guess it's frequency, uh, vibration. I'm sure there's some receptors we haven't discovered yet. Um, the other thing to mention is one thing that can kind of harden the lymphatic system and the lymphatic vessels um, are oxalates. And oxalates are uh, chemical or metabolic byproducts produced by mold, by yeast, and they're high in certain foods. And so um, if you have any, you know, mold or yeast, or you don't have the bacteria in your gut to break down the oxalates, they can sort of crystallize in the lymphatic system. And then there are, you know, many different types of devices out there um, that can get quite expensive that help, usually requires a provider mobilize lymphatic tissue. But another one that's inexpensive uh, is a mini rebounder, or mini trampoline. And so bouncing on that helps to get the lymphatic tissue going or lymphatic fluid moving. Uh -huh. And uh, there are also certain herbs and nutraceuticals like red root or poke root that can help to thin out the lymphatic system. Mm, interesting. I've been so struck as I've learned more about lymphatic support, how gentle it is. That part's not intuitive. At least it wasn't to me. I would have presumed that like lymphatic massage would be sort of squeezing the soft tissue and the expert that opened my eyes up about it said, no, this is very gentle. These lymphatics are super tiny little vessels. And so the kinds of things that help the lymphatics are not intuitive. Taping was another thing that was invoked just so that as the skin moves, the tape shifts the stretch receptors in the skin a little, the lymphatics open up and drain with this very gentle motion. And so I think for a lot of people that benefit, they don't know that uh, these are very gentle modalities. Yeah, absolutely. And one stat that I came across, I don't remember the exact number, but it compared the volume of lymphatic fluid to the volume of blood. And we have significantly more lymphatic fluid than we do blood. And so people often forget that, um, not that the cardiovascular system is not important, but the lymphatic system is also important. Yeah, yeah. I, this has been a big year for me, learning more about that. That's part of what I love about functional medicine is these, these areas that have these striking areas of benefit. They either amplify people's progress or sometimes more importantly, they get people unstuck. And this seems like one of these really big issues is lymphatic uh, stagnation and kind of this low grade uh, uh, chronic toxicity that's perpetuated and furthered by, by not getting the, the junk out. Right, right. And just to let people know, when you start doing this, you may feel a little more fatigued in the beginning, but then uh, pretty soon, usually, it will, your energy will pick up significantly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, share with us a little about how, how it feels for a person to work with you, because you've got different kinds of programs. So given the menu of options, I see uh, you know, you're part of a, a really big network around um, uh, you know, smoothies and what have you, and then people can work with you specifically. And so how would people make choices about how to uh, utilize those resources if they wanted to take a next step? Yeah, so uh, they can email me um, and we can schedule an initial consultation and then we can decide a best plan of action. Obviously, some people you know, need more attention than others. Um, an initial consult is one hour and $3.99, but I wanted to offer your listeners a 10% uh, discount on an initial consult. So if they will you know, put in the subject line of the email, or even in the body of the email, Dr. Rob one zero, then I'll know to extend that uh, discount to them. And I think you're gonna put my website in the show notes. Right, right, yes, thank you. 
thank you for looking out for those folks. And uh, the show notes have the links and the blog clips also have ways for people to drill down, check out your website, learn, learn more about you. So awesome. Yeah. And uh, if they just Google my name and a functional medicine topic, I have, I think it's like 60 hours of free content online from different podcasts, summits, and articles now. It was neat seeing that you've been a thought leader for a significant number of years here. Yeah, as I was... it's amazing what you can learn when you're faced with your own mortality. <laughs> That's a very practical comment, and I don't know of anything more striking as I reflect on the functional medicine community. I think there's a few exceptions, but the majority of folks who end up being passionate about providing it to others had some kind of aspect of their own journey that really made it super important. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I, I like to say, you know, we have skin in the game. Um, and I see, I've never seen a doctor go from functional medicine back to conventional medicine. But I see tons of doctors going from conventional medicine to functional medicine. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, usually, like I, I saw doctors early on, many MDs who said, oh, you know, this stuff doesn't work. And he, then either themselves or a family member, or especially if it's a child or their spouse, um, has a health issue. And then, you know, they turn to functional medicine. And then, you know, that's when it hits them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's such an insightful comment, I think, that once that bigger toolbox is in place, which is such a beautiful adjunct to conventional, nothing's lost. That's the beauty of it to me. Right. It's a this and versus this or type right. of inclusiveness. I, well, I, I state it probably in the strongest possible terms that for me, it would be a Hippocratic oath violation to go backwards to a smaller toolbox once the elegance and uh, majesty right. of that bigger toolbox is available. Yeah. <laughs> and I tell people, you know, I, in the past I had kidney stones and I was sent to the ER and I was not interested in a nutritional IV or a biohacking device or supplement. I wanted the pain meds and I wanted strong ones. Um, and so, you know, traditional medicine, especially in the acute sense and uh, trauma sense, uh, definitely has a, a major role. Uh, so it's not, you know, all functional versus all allopathic. Right. Absolutely. I, I tend to agree with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bland that the, the sort of, um, most important role of conventional medicine and something I'm deeply grateful for is broken bones, brain tumors, the life-threatening bacterial illness, the intensive care unit, right. uh, blood pressure crisis, et cetera. So my hope would just be that we pull whichever tool out of the toolbox we need for that thing. But I am, I'm saddened to see um, you know, silver bullet medicine used for uh, problems that require silver buckshot, the way Dale Bredesen describes right. it where we need that complex backstory. And I'm also, I also love the uh, modalities that emerge that uh, are not, well, for some people, they're very intuitive, I think, and for others, they're not intuitive, but so many of these things reconnect us with how we really work. We're, we're like an right. ecosystem in nature, not a machine. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, that's the problem. People ask me, well, oh, you know, how's this system? What does my gut have to do with my brain? Or what does my musculoskeletal system have to do with my lymphatic system? But, um, you know, we're not, no man is an island, no cell is an island, no tissue is an island. And so um, I think when we realize that, you know, it, you have the dermatologist who's reading dermatology journals, and you have the ophthalmologist who's reading ophthalmology journals, but no one's talking to each other. And sometimes you need that hyper-specialization, but usually it would benefit patients more, in my opinion, if the clinician had uh, an idea of the interconnectedness. Well, certainly that's one of the things that surprised me a little about the Institute for Functional Medicine. I 
I heard over the years, I don't know if it's true, but um, a friend I trust told me, you know, that Google didn't start as a search engine. It started as a plan to develop artificial intelligence many, many years right. ago. And as to for functional medicine, uh, back with its kind of founders, they were hoping to build something to withstand the intellectual rigor to become uh, the new primary care if the right. model could run that far. And it makes so much sense that these uh, super generalists that Mark Hyman would love to see created could again help people really understand their their health as an ecosystem rather than a machine. The heart's Absolutely. not a pump, the nerves aren't just wires, all of it's talking right. to all the rest of it. Um, it right. sounds a little science fiction, but what you and I see every day is it isn't at all. That's that's actually how right. we work. <laughs> yeah. And and you know it's not voodoo. Um, there obviously we learn more and more things, but you know, I think one of the trends in healthcare has been, you know, initially they thought back tissue was just static structural tissue. Now we know it releases tons of inflammatory cytokines and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, things that we discover early on, usually the mechanisms will be elucidated furthermore down the line. Mm -hmm. Well, what a blast getting to talk to you today. Thank you for yeah. what you do. Thank you as well. And thanks for having me. Anything you wanted to share that we didn't get to that you'd like people to know? I would say, uh, you know, just take into consideration your environment. And most of the time, if not all the time, it's difficult to heal in the same environment in which you became unwell. Mm. Mm. Great insight. That's a good one for people to reflect on. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Dr. Tim, and, and have yeah. a great day. Thank you. I appreciate it. Seaworthy exists for people to overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Please consider subscribing, giving us a five-star review if we've earned it, and going to our website podcast tab for any questions or comments you'd like to share with us. Thanks.